Hello, everyone. I'm Cynthia Myers Morrison. I am a webinar chair for Food Addiction Institute Board of Trustees, and it is my pleasure to be here today with these honored guests. Uh, one is Esther Helga Gudmundsdottir, who is the chairperson of the Board of Trustees for Food Addiction Institute, and Susan Pierce Thompson. And first of all, Esther will introduce you to Susan Pierce Thompson, and I'm looking so forward to hearing you and experiencing this time with you. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. I get to uh, introduce you, the, Susan, and uh, I just wanted to say it's 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 wonderful to have you here. And I'm I've been following up on on your success and and your wonderful work for the years that you've been doing it and admiring it. And uh, it, it kind of reminded me of myself as I've been going through uh, doing this kind of work. And, uh, and, and so I see, see a lot of you, me and you, uh, but of course you just managed to do it on such a big scale that it's just admirable. So thank you for your work, Susan. So the bio for you uh, and is uh, Susan P.S. Thompson, PhD. Uh, and uh, she is an adjunct associate professor of brain and cognitive sciences at the University of Rochester and an expert in psychology of eating. She's the president of the Institute for Sustainable Weight Loss and the founder of the worldwide Brightline Eating Movement. The first two books, including Brightline Eating, The Science of Li Living Happy, Thin and Free, uh, became New York Times bestsellers and instantly Hay House favorites. So her work weaves the neuroscience of food addiction with powerful insights from positive psychology, internal family systems, psychology and 12-step recovery to outline a roadmap for achieving true integrity and self-authorship around the food. The Brightline Eating mission is to help 1 million people around the globe discover lasting food freedom and have their bright transformations by 2030. And I just want to say, I hope we, we get to join you. And, you know, we, we better start counting. I know you, you, you have a counter on your uh, <laughs> website, I'm sure. We have some countings, but it doesn't, well, a million would be great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. Well, it's something to strive for. That's what a mission is, right? It's oh, a, it's yeah, a absolutely. And, and put it up there high into the stars for sure. Uh, and we know that that uh, there is just so much need. There's so many millions of people that need this help. So, okay, so just the first question and, you know, to kind of get you going, uh, if you would just tell us about your background, and you know what 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 brought you basically to to doing this work uh and be interested in food addiction science yeah absolutely well thank you cynthia and thank you esther it's so good to be here with you and hello everyone who's watching mm -hmm. i'm so glad you're interested in the topic of food addiction it's such a worthy topic and i came to be interested in it because my background is really in addiction i was um i think concerned about my weight first uh, maybe by the age of 11 or 12, I weighed more than I weigh now. And I started to become concerned about my weight. And um, I did try dieting. But by the age of 14, I found the most effective diet probably ever, which is drugs. And I got hooked on drugs, actually. Um, before I was really hooked on food, I was hooked on drugs. And the drugs that I did escalated from, you know, the pod and alcohol and and psychedelics, and then graduated to crystal methamphetamine or speed, which I did starting when I was 16 and 17. And uh, it scrambled my brain pretty badly. It, it causes drug induced psychosis, which I had, and I dropped out of high school at that time, and then started snorting cocaine and then freebasing it and then mm -hmm. smoking crack cocaine and um, turned to prostitution to get enough money for the crack cocaine. And that was my life at the age of 19. Um, at the age of 20, I got clean and sober, um, working the 12 steps and uh, going to meetings. And that 
uh, just the miracle of, of getting clean and sober is the biggest miracle of my life. That was August 9th of 1994. So, uh, 28 years clean and sober now. And, um, but I knew at that time when I was smoking crack, I knew that it was keeping me, it was keeping my weight in check. And I knew when I put down the drugs that my weight would become a problem again. And it did. But what happened then was that I could see my eating for what it was when the, when I didn't have drugs to use anymore. Um, I was going to meetings late at night. Um, I was 20 years old and I would go to fast food places and convenience stores and grocery stores and buy food and go home and into this one little bedroom that I rented where I was living. And I was eating like I used to smoke crack. I was eating like I used to use drugs. I had my my foods all around me and I would binge and then I would go out and smoke a cigarette and come back in and binge some more. And I had an awareness one night as I was looking at these bowls and boxes and bags and all this food around me that I wasn't just eating, I was using, that I was using this food like I used drugs. And I knew right then that it was not sober behavior and I wasn't really sober, I was using still. And um, I didn't know what to do about it then, although I did um, uh, get pointed in the direction of 12 step food programs at that time. And the challenge was that I didn't get abstinent quickly the way I got sober when I stopped using drugs and alcohol, um, you know, drugs and alcohol are relatively easy to stop in comparison with food. You have to, um, be shown kind of what exactly you're abstaining from and how to eat. And I didn't immediately, when I went into the food recovery rooms, I didn't immediately find people who had that clarity to, to give me. So, um, it was another eight years before I found my own food recovery, eight years of binging and, losing weight and gaining weight and really a lot of dieting essentially, but I was doing it within 12 step programs and going to meetings and sharing and getting support and so forth. So at that time, my weight climbed up into obesity and I was obese. I had obesity by my, by the time I was 25, 26 years old. Um, but you know, it's so interesting. Food addiction is, um, how do I put it? You can succeed in life, even using food addictively. I couldn't succeed in life while I was snorting crystal meth addictively or smoking crack cocaine addictively. I couldn't be successful in life, but with food I could. And, and I actually used caffeine and sugar and, and food and, and, um, and was incredibly successful academically after I found the 12 steps and, and got clean and sober. I went to community college in California and transferred to UC Berkeley and got straight A's and spoke at the graduation and um, got into all these graduate schools and ended up getting my PhD in brain and cognitive sciences um, at the University of Rochester and then studying in Australia um, and getting a postdoc in psychology at the University of New South Wales. And I started studying addiction. I started studying how the mind and the brain can go so far off the rails with these addictions. And uh, I ended up teaching psychology for about 18 years at different colleges and universities around the world and getting tenure. And one of the courses that I taught was in the psychology of eating and the neuroscience of food addiction. So I taught that course for about eight years um, up until I founded Brightline Eating in 2014. Um, and then in 2016, I ended up giving back tenure and committing myself uh, full time to Brightline Eating and to disseminating information uh, to the world about the science of food addiction. So anyway, the short answer to your question is I come by my interest in food addiction. Honestly, I come by it from my own suffering and my own experience. And I've been in my own right sized body now for um, 19 years, you know, so uh, I found food recovery when I was 28. Um, and I've, I've been you know, uh, on the path ever since. So that's, that's how it happened for me in my background. Okay. What an incredible story. Cynthia, do you want to ask a question? Sure. Oh, it is an incredible story. I love it. <laughs> so we have many similarities. <laughs> we'll have to talk sometime offline. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the food addiction um, some people say food addiction is real and others say, oh, no, food addiction is very controversial. So where do you come down with this and how how do you see this? Yeah, I 
I, it's one of my missions in life to spread the word that food addiction is real. And, you know, um, my PhD is in brain and cognitive sciences, and I have a background in neuroscience. And you know who never, ever, ever says that food addiction is controversial? Uh, neuroscientists who study the brain. <laughs> People who study addiction in the brain, they know that food addiction is real because you can see it on the brain scans. You just look at the brain scans and you can circle, you know, the nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmental area and the insula, sort of these, the addiction reward pathways in the brain get hijacked by highly processed foods, just like they get uh, hijacked by heroin and cocaine and other drugs of abuse. And really, if you think about how those drugs get made, they get made in the same way, right? I mean, cocaine is essentially a naturally occurring plant that's harmless uh, on its own, like the coca leaf, people pluck the coca leaves and put it in their cheek and chew it. And it's not addictive. There's actually a scientific paper that's published showing it's not addictive, but it's when you take the inner essence of that plant and then you extract it and you refine and purify it down into a fine powder. Now you've taken that harmless plant and you've turned it into a drug through the manufacturing process, right? And that's what we're doing with sugar and flour. We're taking harmless substances like corn and beets and weed and rice and potatoes and all healthy foods naturally. And we're extracting the inner essence and then refining and purifying it down into a powder or uh, a sticky liquid in the case of high fructose corn syrup, which is very similar to heroin actually. Um, yeah. And we're taking those plants and we're turning them into a drug. So food addiction is not controversial. It's, I mean, there are people who will debate it with you, but they're not people who know about addiction in the brain. Food addiction in the brain is pretty cut and dried. The evidence now for it is enormous and overwhelming. Um, so that's where I come down on that. And I think it's really important as a society that we really understand that food addiction is real. Yes, indeed. So, so it's it's always so fun for me to uh, to hear people that really know the science of the brain, and you know I've heard that quite a few people talk about it, but I'd like to hear you talk about uh, how how this uh, food addiction manifests in the brain. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there are a few ways actually. the The core of it, though, is something called dopamine downregulation. So dopamine is the neurotransmitter of addiction. That's the primary neurotransmitter in the reward center of the brain. Uh, and all the, the structures that I was just mentioning, the nucleus accumbens in particular, and the ventral tegmental area and so forth. These are dopaminergic um, structures. So that means that they're using the neurotransmitter dopamine to communicate, to, to send signals. And what happens when you uh, eat a donut, for example. It's the same thing that happens when you watch pornography or smoke a cigarette or shoot some heroin, um, all of these, or, or gamble um, and you know win a jackpot. Uh, what happens is those areas in the brain get flooded with an unnatural avalanche of dopamine, just more than they ever could get through normal sort of daily life. And that's fine. I mean, it feels pretty great. But what happens then over time is that those receptors downregulate, meaning they thin out and they become less numerous and less responsive, you know, so that when the next onslaught comes, they're more prepared for with a more sort of measured response, which is fine. Uh, but now you're rewiring the brain. And what's going to happen now is you're not going to have enough dopamine on board during regular boring old life. And you're going to start to feel restless and irritable and discontent, you know, itchy and kind of just not good enough. And so you're going to need to get a, a donut now every morning um, and probably uh, other foods throughout the day, a bag of chips after that and a piece of pizza at lunch. And, and, you know, it's going to go on from there and you've got to be topping up every, you know, couple few hours uh, in order to, to just feel okay. So at this point, the addict the addict isn't using to feel high, they're using to feel normal, just to get back to a baseline because that dopamine has downregulated. So that's what you see in the brains of heroin addicts, cocaine addicts, sugar addicts, is you see um, a, a low dopamine response in the reward centers of the brain at baseline. So kind of when they're just, the person's just 
you know, just looking at regular pictures of regular things, there's this weak kind of gimpy sort of dopamine response in those areas. And when you try to do something to light them up, it doesn't do that much unless you give it a really hard hit um, of some highly rewarding stimulus. Um, so that's, that's the core of what, of what food addiction looks like in the brain. There are additional uh, things that we see that are characteristic of addicts. So one is um, uh, heightened cue reactivity. So cues that predict the reward, like in the case of a food addict, it would be you know, the images of the logos of favorite fast food places or um, or even the time of day where they usually get off work and then get something yummy to eat or, um, you know, the smell of certain baking foods. These are cues that predict that a food hit is coming. And what you see in people who are who have addiction uh, to food addiction um, is that their brains respond more intensely to those stimuli than other brains. Um, so that's another thing you see. And you see that with drug addicts and alcoholics and nicotine addicts as well. Uh, heightened Q reactivity is one of the salient properties of addiction in the brain. Um, and I can go on. There's more, there's more aspects to addiction in the brain. One is, is a hijacking of the liking and wanting systems. So there's an interesting thing where the, the normal brain um, wants something, you know, to a certain extent, let's say you're at a, an amusement park and people say, oh, do you want to get some cotton candy or some ice cream? And they might want that a little bit. But then when they get it, they like it. They're like, hmm, that's good, right? Whereas the food addicted brain wants it a lot, might spend hours thinking about it intensely. Like, when can we get some ice cream? When can I convince everybody to get some ice cream? I really want to get some ice cream. But then when the ice cream actually comes, they don't like it that much. So the wanting is huge and the liking is small, which basically results in someone who's addicted um, always continuing to need more to feel satisfied, like needing to get another hit, needing to find more and even reaching a point where they're eating and it tastes like sawdust or cardboard. Like they're just thinking this doesn't even taste good anymore. Why am I eating this? Because the, the liking system has been blunted, but the wanting system has been hijacked. And so you're spending your life wanting and not even liking it anymore, which is hard for someone who's not addicted to understand, well, if you don't even like it, why are you eating it, right? Why are you eating it if you're saying it doesn't taste good? And the answer is because, oh, I still want it. You know, I might not like it, but I still need it. I still want it. Um, and then the last uh, system that I'll talk about is leptin resistance. So this is on board with food addiction and also with uh, pernicious weight gain. Uh, what happens is the brain isn't able to see the hormone anymore that says it's time to stop eating, you're full, you're satiated, and it's time to go get active and use all this fuel that you just consumed to do something productive already. Go go build a hut, go find a mate, go kill a wildebeest, go do something with all this fuel you just ingested, uh, do, do something productive. Um, so those of us who don't feel full anymore, um, our brain isn't ever seeing that leptin. It's We have plenty of leptin in circulating in our blood. And actually, if you've, if you've gained weight, odds are you've got plenty of leptin because it's the fat cells that are nice and full and plump and juicy that produce that leptin. So you've probably got plenty of leptin. If only your brain could see it, you could stop eating. But the challenge is that the brain's not seeing the leptin anymore. It's called leptin resistance. And it's, the, it's essentially the key to the obesity pandemic. Um, but what's happening is high inflammation, high insulin levels and high triglycerides are blocking leptin in the brain. And so the brain is um, all the while the person is obese, the brain is actually sitting there thinking that they're starving to death. Um, and the, the cue that you're full never comes and the cue to get active never comes. So you just sit on the couch and you've eaten a full dinner, but now you need a big bag of chips. And then now the chips are gone. And now you need to go get the tub of ice cream. And now the ice cream is gone. And if you consult with your stomach, your stomach will say, I'm pretty full over here, but it doesn't really matter because the brain still needs more food and the elbow still needs to bend and the mouth needs to chew. And there's still like this 
intense need to keep eating food. And um, yeah, the, the real feeling of like, I'm done eating never comes for these folks. And that's leptin resistance. So you put all this together and, um, and it's a lot. It's, it's no wonder people have a hard time um, stopping eating and saying no, thank you. Yeah. So right on with that. You've said that eating compulsively, food addiction wise, might be the hardest to stop of all the addictions. So why is that? Is that these things that you've just mentioned or are there other symptoms and systems that are involved? Yeah, you know, the things I just mentioned, a lot of them have to do with any addiction. Um, uh, I do believe that food is the hardest addiction to kick. It's been the hardest addiction for me. And, you know, I am someone who was a hope to die crack addict. I mean, I was, I was living my life in loops from prostitution into the crack house and out again to get more money. And, you know, for not a tiny amount of time, like that was my life. So I feel, um, qualified to weigh in on which addiction is the hardest to kick. Cause I think if you survey a lot of people and you say, you know, what's the hardest drug to kick, um, probably heroin and crack cocaine would be named by most people. You know, I bet cigarettes would get a fair number of votes as well. Um, but I truly, and I've been hooked on cigarettes. Hope, oh gosh, have I been hooked on cigarettes? Oh my gosh, hard, hard, hard to kick for sure. Um, food is the hardest. I really do believe food is the hardest. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, I think one of the reasons is that the circuitry in the brain that's been hijacked in the case of food addiction is really as primitive as it gets because our brains actually uh, are designed to be nonstop food seeking machines. You know, if you think about how much the procurement consumption and further procurement and further consumption of food had to be wired in to our neural circuitry to ensure our survival, right? There's no other addiction that even comes close. I mean, you can have sex, you know, three or four times in your life and, you know, have enough offspring to, to keep your genes going, right? But you have got to eat multiple times every single day without fail. Um, and that's a big order. So, so that's one thing, right? The, the addictions to, you know, cigarettes and alcohol and cocaine and heroin, none of them are hijacking um, primitive circuitry like that, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're taking advantage of circuitry that's very primitive that exists for other purposes, but food is primary and it was designed that way. So that's one reason. Um, I think one of the biggest reasons that food is the hardest to kick is that it's really, really maddeningly hard to tell whether you're abstaining appropriately or not, because you have to keep eating. And, you know, I, I only once in my whole recovery life have been unclear about whether I was clean and sober or not, right? Typically, I know whether I've had a drink and I know whether I've had a drug. Um, sometimes it gets fuzzy. I'm just going to move the, the sun is coming in through my little blinds and I'm going to just scooch myself over here so I don't get weird, weird lips on me. Um, you know, I know, generally speaking, whether I've had a drink and you do, too. Right. I did have this moment, though, where I'd made a big batch of raw cookie dough because I was binging in my active food addiction and I'd put enough vanilla extract in it and eaten this batch. And then I, I knew I wasn't abstinent when it came to my food program, but then I was like, Oh no, did I just drink alcohol? Um, because I just had this, this vanilla extract. Generally speaking though, I'm pretty clear whether I've had a drink or a drug, right. But, but with food, you know, it can be incredibly, uh, subtle and, and maddeningly confusing, whether you are, abstinent according to the definitions of your plan. You need to, in my opinion, you need to abstain from um, the, the, the foods and the behaviors that cause you difficulty in order to recover from food addiction. But whether you're doing that or not is really hard to tell. So um, so that, you know, it, it is just way harder to quit. It's easier to quit smoking. It's easier to quit drinking. It's easier to quit drugs. Um, you know, I do think that 
uh, the sex addiction relationship addiction domain has some of the, some sort of similar fuzziness to the food addiction realm if you're trying to abstain from certain things there. But food addiction is um, oof, food addiction is really hard. So another reason that it's hard is that not always, but often and usually, food addiction goes along with a weight problem. But the problem there, and, and when people try to recover from food addiction, they're also often trying to lose the excess weight that they gained when they were active in their food addiction. The trouble with that is that the brain uh, knows when we're losing weight in a sustained way and it creates hormonal shifts that drive us back into our food addiction. Now, this is unprecedented in the world of addiction and recovery. Like imagine that you lived in a world where drinking alcohol caused terrible, fatal, disfiguring acne. So as you drink alcohol, it's causing this acne, but now you get hooked on the alcohol, you drink more alcohol, you get more acne. It's not just terrible acne, but it's fatal acne. And so when you quit drinking, now you've got all this acne. And now imagine that the only treatment known to humankind for this acne causes one terrible side effect, and that's profound and intense cravings to drink alcohol. And so you try to cure the acne, and now you're driven back to the bottle to drink more alcohol. That's the loop that we get trapped in when it comes to food addiction. We, dr we eat food addictively, we gain weight, and then the only known remedy for the weight problem is a sustained caloric deficit, which, which creates hormonal changes that drive us back to binge style eating. And it's absolutely maddening. So there's another reason that food addiction is the hardest. We can't eat while we're recovering. We can't just be left alone to recover. This is why some experts sometimes recommend that someone with extreme food addiction not try to lose their weight at first, like actually go on a plan that will stabilize their weight as opposed to help them lose weight just so that they're not dealing with both at the same time if the food addiction is really intense. Um, I, can I please go on? I've got a couple more. There are, there are yet more reasons why food is the hardest. So, <laughs> go ahead. so, so cigarettes are really hard to quit as well. They're not as hard as food. But one of the things that makes cigarettes hard is the number of temporal and location-based cues to smoke, right? Because you smoke cigarettes if you're an active smoker a whole lot. And it's right up there with the amount that you eat if you're an active food addict, right? Which is way more than people typically drink or shoot heroin or have sex or that sort of thing, right? Um, well, food is right up there with cigarettes. And, and what I mean by that is you can't really find a time of day or a place where people aren't conditioned to eat, right? We're conditioned to eat all the time. You can't even go into a 10 a.m. work meeting anymore without a cue to eat, without a, a, a tray of Danish and bagels being passed around or a coffee station with cream and sugar right there that you're being pointed at as the work meeting starts. Uh, we're, you know, you can't go to a movie without passing the snack bar. You can't go, you can't go anywhere that people are gathering to do stuff without being cued to eat. So um, that basically turns your whole day into a nonstop barrage of uh, conditioned reinforcers to go back to your drug. And, you know, I got to say, I was very grateful that when I stopped smoking crack, I had this world to enter back into where I was blissfully free of triggers and cues and reminders to smoke crack. As soon as I left the world, the sort of underworld that I was living in, um, I was hardly ever cued anymore to smoke crack, right? It was rare that I got, you know, maybe if I had, um, you know, someone handed me some money and I had, you know, two or three or four $20 bills in my hand, that might be a cue like where I would, I would want to go use with that money. Um, or if I drove kind of into a part of town that that reminded me, but it wasn't a part of town that I visited very often because that wasn't where I lived or worked. It was sort of a different part of town, right? Um, whereas when you think about food, you can't go anywhere, anywhere without the the people, places and things that are associated with your food addiction being up in your face and confronting you. 
And then we've got the multi uh, trillion dollar food industry um, just shoving uh, commercials and, um, you know, uh, cues again to eat in our face. So they're actually now putting people in fMRI machines and testing their latest commercials and their latest snack food concoctions on people and looking at the brain and making sure that their formulations hit the addictive centers of the brain optimally, that those parts of the brain light up on fire with that commercial, with that flavor, with that taste. Um, so they know that they've got us hooked and they're deliberately manipulating the environment to optimize it. Now, we don't have companies that have those kinds of budgets and those kinds of um, incentives. I mean, the, the incentives are there with the drug community and so forth with, you know, drug dealers and so forth, but they're not organized in that same way. They don't have those same resources. Um, and there's no sort of organized campaign to keep us all hooked the way uh, there is with food. And then the last one I think is just we're so behind the eight ball with society where we still live in a society where people think it's okay to push food on people and they do it all the time. Right. And, you know, I've been sober from alcohol now for 28 years, thank God. And I have experienced over those 28 years, how society has grown a lot in when new year's Eve comes around people don't push alcohol on me anymore, almost ever. Um, as a matter of fact, they trip over themselves to get me some sparkling water or something, you know, non-alcoholic to drink on New Year's Eve. But I still get pushed all the time to eat foods in ways that aren't healthy for me. And, you know, I live in the United States and on Thanksgiving, you know, try abstaining from pumpkin pie. Your family will have none of it. They'll, they'll shame you for dieting on Thanksgiving and, you know, you're thin enough already. Why are you still dieting? You know, and not understanding that when I eat pumpkin pie, I'm hurting myself and I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to keep eating and I'm going to want more and more and more. And it's not going to be, uh, a self-affirming action for me, but we still live in a society where when someone moves into the neighborhood, people think it's a good idea to bake them cookies and bring it over. When kids have birthday parties, they think that pizza and cake and ice cream is the thing to serve. Um, when someone's sick, they bring over sweets, you know, which is ridiculous. That's not good for the immune system, nor for anybody's health. So we still live in a society where food is actively pushed and we haven't quite gotten our head around the fact that We've all got to really change the way we orient toward food to understand that, you know, more than two thirds of us now are suffering with weight challenges and are going to die too young and in pain from the foods that we're eating, whether we're addicted to it or not. Uh, it's not healthy for any of us to keep eating the way we've been eating as a society. So um, the food pushing is, is quite a problem. And, um, I think we also evolved to want to eat the same way as the people around us eat. And so as our society, uh, still, you know, is eating most of its foods as ultra processed foods, when you decide to eat differently, you've got to break stride with the people around you, friends and family who are eating differently. And that's incredibly difficult. Um, I think people who um, are recovering alcoholics sometimes experience something similar to that when the people around them are drinking and there's a societal push to, to drink. But there are mercifully so many occasions and circumstances where people are not expecting you to drink, like all throughout the workday, for example. You can go to a work meeting and nobody's shoving booze in your face, whereas, you know, with food, you're facing it all day long. So food is the hardest addiction to kick for all of those reasons. Absolutely. I so agree with you. And, uh, you know, coming from, again, you know, the leptin resistance, it, you know, it, it, I remember when I was getting uh, abstinent and, and sober in my food, uh, it took me quite, well, actually, it didn't really take me long after I got abstinent. And one of the things that I experienced was that I felt the fullness. For the first time, I think you know almost ever, and uh, yeah. you know so so something shifted in that way as well as as abstinence yeah. came on and uh, yeah the blood recovers really quickly. So the things I mentioned that cause the leptin resistance: high baseline insulin levels, mm -hmm. high triglycerides, 
and high inflammation, especially in the ventral medial nucleus of the hypothalamus. Um, so in the hypothalamus there, that's, that's controlling our eating behavior. Um, and, uh, those, those correct in a matter of weeks, really like days and weeks. Um, you know, those things can, when you stop eating sugar and flour and you start eating a healthy diet with lots of vegetables and so forth, the blood corrects very quickly. So, um, yeah, luckily, uh, those plagues can, can, uh, can be lifted. Yeah. Yeah. We can recover. That's the next thing here. You know, there's recovery. We do the right thing. So, so, so I, you know, you've told me and I've seen, and I've noticed that you've been doing research, uh, quite a bit and working with researchers. Uh, and you've been researching, uh, and so I think everybody does that, that does uh, clinical work with uh, food addicts. Uh, we see the changes. That's just so evident. But I'm excited to hear uh, about your research, research on when people adopt uh, abstinence-based way of, of eating. What what does uh, your research show? Yes. And can you give me uh, sharing permissions on the Zoom here? Just oh, absolutely. Share? Yes. I have um, a slide that I want to show that will set the stage. Um, okay. Can you see this? Yes. All right. So the program that I started eight years ago is called Bright Line Eating. And you'll see that over here on the left. Mm -hmm. On the Y axis here, you've got percent weight loss. Those aren't pounds. Those aren't kilos. That's percentage of starting body weight. Um, just for reference, 5% of starting body weight lost is what's considered clinically significant weight loss, 5%. So that would be down yeah. here. Yeah. And what you see is all of the generally accepted commercial weight loss programs have about the same results. If you look at initial weight loss, which on this graph has been standardized to the first two months, mm -hmm. the first two months, and then one year weight loss, you see that they're producing, you know, maybe about um, uh, clinically significant weight loss, which would be 5%, mm -hmm. and maybe maintaining it for one year, you'll notice that there aren't any bars for two year weight loss, other than bright line eating, because they don't publish two year weight loss, because everybody <laughs> regains not everybody, but most people regain their weight. Yeah. Uh, so the bars would be back to nothing after at, at two years. So they don't publish that typically. Um, and so just so you know, all of these um, are scientifically peer reviewed journal publications. That's where we got these data from. This wasn't um, one big study where everyone was randomly assigned to different, uh, different weight loss programs. That would have been the ideal way to do this. Um, this is rather a lot of little studies that were all done in different ways, collected over the scientific literature and just normalized by, you know, two months versus one year versus two years. And this is what you find. Um, and you can see that bright line eating is a huge outlier. I mean, uh, results that are, uh, far and away above what other programs do and maintained, um, mm -hmm. not just weight lost, but maintained. And this is across not just a few people, but hundreds of people. Yes. Um, and so um, what bright line uh, refers to, a bright line is a legal term, actually. Um, a bright line rule is a clear, unambiguous boundary that you apply every time to produce consistent results. Mm -hmm. And so the, the alcoholic who wants to get sober uh, puts up a bright line for alcohol. And the rule is no drinking ever, even on New Year's Eve, even at a party, even on my birthday, no drinking ever. That's a bright line rule. Um, the person who is addicted to cigarettes and is smoking two packs a day and has discovered they have lung cancer and wants to live will uh, wisely decide to have a bright line for cigarettes, no cigarettes ever, even at a concert, even at a party, no cigarettes. And the bright lines for food um, that we adopt in bright line eating are two bright lines related to the substance addiction of food. So uh, no sugar and no flour is how we define that. Now, there's different ways to define those bright lines. We like no sugar, no flour, because that pretty much encompasses all of the processed foods. You can't really go around eating ultra processed foods if you're not eating sugar and flour. So 
Um, and by no sugar, we mean nothing added to the food to make it sweeter. That includes artificial sweeteners. Um, and then two bright lines that also have to do with the process addiction of eating. So eating is one of the, well, I think it's the only one that I know of, actually. It's the only addiction that's both a substance addiction and a process addiction. So it's addiction to the substance of ultra processed foods and it's addiction to the, to the behavior or the process of eating itself. And when you have a food addiction, you have a brain that says, I want to eat more. I want to eat now. Is it time to eat now? How about now? How about now? How about now? And the bright lines for meals and quantities are what arrest that process. So, um, so that means uh, typically eating three meals a day, although the bright line for meals is not a bright line for three meals a day. It's a bright line for meals. So as long as you're not snacking or grazing, there are some people who need to eat more than three times a day. There are some people who prefer to eat just two meals a day. Um, that's all fine. It just has to be a bright line for meals and then uh, quantities as well. So in bright line eating, we weigh and measure our food. And that's not so that we don't eat much. We actually eat a lot of food. It's actually more so that you eat enough, especially enough vegetables, uh, which people will not do if you don't have them put it on a digital food scale. We get more complaints that there's too much to eat in bright line eating than the other way around. Um, so the first uh, lines of research are what I showed in that graph right there, uh, a massive amount of weight loss sustained over the long term. Now, the other um, published studies that we've done have shown that hunger and cravings go down, 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 down with bright line eating till they're little or no hunger or cravings anymore ever which is quite remarkable because remember people are losing weight all this time. And uh, in the weight loss literature, typically when people are losing weight, their, their hunger is kicked up because the brain gets hungry when it's losing weight. Uh, and also cravings tend to get kicked up as well. So it's very interesting that by eliminating sugar and flour altogether, cravings pretty much go away. Um, and it takes less than two months for the cravings to go away. They go down, they start moderately high and they go down to little or nothing by the end of two months, cravings are gone. And that tracks with the healing of the dopamine receptors. I was talking earlier about dopamine downregulation, and that's the clinical manifestation of the healing, the regeneration of those dopamine receptors. Um, so there, there aren't cravings anymore. Um, we published another study that I'm super proud of and super excited by. It's kind of mind blowing. We looked at uh, age cohorts in bright line eating because we have thousands of people who've been through bright line eating. And um, so we just broke them into age cohorts and we looked at the rate of weight loss in those first two months among people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s. And what we found was no difference in rate of weight loss in those different age cohorts, which means that doing bright line eating has taken a postmenopausal woman and turned her into the fat losing capacity of a woman who's in her twenties or thirties. Now that might sound ridiculous because we all know that it's harder to lose weight after menopause. Um, but the reason it's harder to lose weight after menopause, and this is true for men too, it's, it's not a male female thing, but it is an estrogen thing. Um, and men have estrogens as well. Estrogen is not just a hormone, it's a class of hormones. And men and women have at both estrogens and androgens alike. Um, and for both men and women, after the age of 50, um, estrogen goes down low and pretty much stays very, very low at that point. Um, the problem with low estrogen is that estrogen has a facilitating effect on insulin, which is a fat storage and fat release hormone that helps us manage our blood sugar. So when you're eating sugar and flour and sending your blood sugar for a loop, you better have really good insulin uh, control. And that's what estrogen helps with. But when you're not eating sugar and flour and you're not sending your blood sugar for a loop, then it doesn't much matter as much if you've got enough estrogen on board to help your insulin. So when you take sugar and flour out of the equation, you level the playing field and suddenly a woman who's in her fifties or sixties or seventies loses weight. Like she's 20 or 30 again. So that's exciting for people who are over the age of 50 and really want to lose their weight again, finally. Um, so yeah, love that study. Um, what else? We did an interesting study around COVID times. So 
after COVID hit and kind of receded, um, we looked back on our data and we looked at measures of psychosocial health. So we looked at depression. We looked at days of poor mental health. And then on the positive side, we looked at energy levels, quality of life, happiness and flourishing, and perceived social support. Like how readily would someone say, I feel fully loved and connected and supported in the world. I feel confident that if I were going through a hard time, I know people who would come over to my house and help me in an emergency right away, that sort of thing. Um, and we looked at those metrics and we looked at how much they improved after people started doing bright line eating. But we compared two time, time scales. First, we looked just generally speaking, um, how much did, uh, did people improve? And the answer was uh, across all of those metrics, a whopping improvement. I mean, a huge effect size. Like if you know the statistics, P less than 0.0001, like really big effect size, which means that not only is bright line eating helping people to lose weight and recover from food addiction and get rid of their hunger and cravings, but it's making them um, far more energetic, healthy, flourishing, and socially connected and less depressed, um, less anxious. So that's amazing. But then we did an interesting thing. We compared um, sort of a general time frame before and after with the specific three months when COVID was hitting us all initially. I'm talking about April, May, and June of 2020. And I'm sure you remember those months, April, May, and June of 2020, when, you know, we were all at home and we didn't know what was happening to our world. And it was a very, very disturbing time for all of us. Well, we compared people's improvement during those three months versus times before and after. And what we found was during the heat of, of COVID descending on us, the effect was not only there, but it was whoppingly significantly bigger still, showing that when people are going through the hardest of hard times, the social support and the structured eating of Brightline Eating gives them a boost even beyond what it would under normal circumstances, giving some clue to that it helps build in some resistance, some resilience, some psychological and physical resilience to um, hard to hard times, right? Um, yeah, so those are some of the studies that we've published with Brightline Eating and, um, and more in the works, um, but that's a taste of our research program here at Brightline Eating. Those are so fabulous and wonderful to hear. Are they listed as bright line eating um, in the research literature, specifically in the titles? Um, so you can find all the publications on the bright line eating website. And so I'm trying to think, I don't think they all have bright line eating in the titles, but I can, I can get you, I can send you to a webpage that has yeah. the full reference list of all those publications. Yeah. But, I don't think they all, some of them have bright line eating. I think our two papers in the journal of nutrition and weight loss have bright line eating in the titles. Um, and I know that some of them do not have bright line eating in the titles, but yeah. Fabulous. Fabulous. Well, one of the things that I'm curious about are people, is there a binary binary split between people who are food addicts and people who are not food addicts? Some Good people question. would say yes, but yeah. Yeah, no, you know, I think, I think food addiction programs often talk about it that way, where, well, you got to figure out if you're a food addict, right? And I don't think it's binary. I think that um, addiction is along a continuum. And um, I, I think of it as a scale from one to 10, with one being low and 10 being high. So I'm a 10, big shocker. Um, but you know, where's the cutoff? Is it at seven? Is it at six? Is it at five? Is it at nine? You know, I think the Yale food addiction scale, um, makes the cutoff so that, you know, nines and tens would be considered food addicts and people who are lower would not. 
Um, is that the place for the cutoff? I don't know. What I do know is that in my experience, people who, um, you know, are sixes and above, whereas a six, you know, would not have an eating history like mine, you know, binging their brains out and struggling the way I've struggled. Still, what they're going to find is they have enough addiction on board that it's going to keep them from maintaining, you know, a healthy weight or sticking with a weight loss program, or it's probably going to be disturbing at times when they find that, you know, they're losing control over how much they eat once they start, or um, they're not feeling satisfied by a normal amount of food, or the thoughts of what they've eaten or not eaten are sort of more in their head than they wish they were. Um, or they have some cravings for a specific food that are problematic that they wish they didn't have. And, um, you know, these are some of the signs of, of food addiction, and you can have them to a slight degree or to an extreme degree. What our research program shows is that um, one third of people don't have it at all. Don't have it at all. And one third of people have it a lot and one third or more in the middle. So, um, yeah, and, and by the clinical standards, I think it's about 20% have food addiction, something like that, 19, 20%, something like that. And that's according to the Yale Food Addiction Scale and according to our instrument, which is the susceptibility scale. Um, you know, but, but, but more than 20% have enough food addiction on board to maybe be something that they want to address. Um, and then I also you know, think it's important to understand that not everybody has this problem. Not everybody does. Um, some people really don't have it at all and can absolutely take one bite of cake or, you know, a cookie or whatever and take it or leave it. Uh, one bite doesn't make them want more. As a matter of fact, it might make them want less. They might think, oh, that's enough. I just needed that, you know, that one little taste is all I needed. And, oh, that's a little sweet. I don't really want that anymore. Um, and some people really orient that way toward these foods. So it's important to understand how much huge variety there is in the way brains respond to food. Thank you. Wow, this has been great. <laughs> you want to ask her about society? Yeah. I'm interested. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There's, you know, we could, we could be on here. I just wanted to say it was so interesting to see, you know, the results from your uh, your, the, the, the research that you do, because it's the same as what I get from the research I do on my treatment. And for the ones that I have seen, it's, it, there's, you know, where, where people are getting treatment with abstinence food plans and, and support and, and, you know, having work done, uh, that's, that's, it is like 30% long time, like 70, 80% in the first year. It's, it's, it's extravagant success and the changes. I'm just so happy that you're doing these, the science is, is so much needed and we need to be doing more of that for sure. So coming to, you know, uh, and I, I know this has been a challenge for me, I'm sure it is for you because as you've been saying, we live in this world, which is just, you know, let's use and let's not be deprived, you know? and. <laughs> So what do you think uh, the society needs so that we catch up uh, with, uh, with uh, the research? Yeah, totally. Well, I've mentioned some of the things already. I think we all really need to understand that food addiction is real. Yeah. We just need to understand that already. Mm -hmm. um, and to understand that not everyone is affected. So there are going to be people who absolutely can eat chips and chocolate and, you know, pizza and cookies and cake, and it's fine for them, right? And they can do it in moderation. And, and that's absolutely fine. But we're going to need some um, protections for the, the people in our society who are the most vulnerable, meaning people who have brains that are more susceptible to food addiction, and also children, right, who, whose brains are still forming, and don't have a full say yet. And unfortunately, the way we're feeding our kids right now with kids menus and restaurants, we're guiding our children to eat mostly ultra processed foods. And research shows that the vast majority, vast majority of foods that children and adolescents are eating these days are ultra processed foods. And, you know, when we when we expose rats to that kind of diet, they never will go back. You try to give them regular rat pellets afterwards, they'll starve themselves to death. Um, they will not tolerate the salad bar option after being given a buffet of, 
you know, sugar cereals and, you know, sausage and Twinkies and cupcakes, they won't ever go back to eating rat pellets. Literally, they will starve themselves to death. So we're creating kids who won't eat vegetables, who won't eat regular foods. And um, the toll on those children and on society the toll is going to be enormous, right? These are going to be children who are going to have diabetes, you know, by the age of 30 or 40, that means leg amputations and blindness and in, in midlife. Um, and financially, the toll on society is enormous. It's, it's, it's breaking our bank, and it's going to get worse. So um, what we need to understand is that for people who have brains that are more susceptible to the pull of those addictive foods, a more structured way of eating is going to be helpful and it's going to produce freedom, not restraint. You know, there's actually a statistic that I didn't share with you, which is the vast majority of people who start bright line eating after two months say that their peace and serenity with food has increased. Almost everyone says this. It's like more than three quarters of people. And so what's interesting about that is that you've asked them to stop eating sugar altogether, stop eating flour altogether, start weighing and measuring everything they eat, no snacking anymore. And they report now that their peace and serenity with food has skyrocketed. And so this is because they have a brain that wants more structure when it comes to food. And our society has gone so far toward the continuum of unstructured eating right? Eat whatever you want, whenever you want. Most people wake up today and have no idea what they're going to eat. They're just going to play it by ear. They're going to wing it. They leave the house without a lunch packed. They're just going to, you know, uh, catch as catch can with food throughout the day. And um, there is uh, health and wellness that's associated with a structured way of eating for a lot of us. And so I know that the food addiction community has, sorry, the eating disorders community has pushed hard toward a no food rules approach to eating, where if you're going to eliminate sugar from your diet, not just moderate it, but eliminate it, that that's not healthy. And you'll even see people on social media saying it, it causes eating disorders to give up food groups. And I lovingly remind them that sugar is not a food group. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, but we need to understand that a more structured way of eating actually does produce freedom for a lot of people, right? Um, I also think that at a societal level, we're going to need to address with taxes and laws against advertising um, some of the uh, exposure to the cues that are keeping our addictive eating society afloat in the same way that we have with cigarettes and alcohol. You know, you can't you can't advertise cigarettes and alcohol uh, now in the way that you used to, especially toward children. Um, and in the United Kingdom now, they have instituted a law that I believe is gonna come into effect January 1st, 2023. If you're watching this video after that, it may already be in effect, um, that prohibits the advertising of any hyperpalatable food. That's like any junk food really at all, really. Um, between 5.30 a.m. and 9 p.m., which is when kids are watching TV. And it's not just TV. It's also on social media. It's also on the internet. No advertisements at all. That means the McDonald's can advertise, but they have to show people eating salads. And so I do think that it's going to take um, taxes on sodas and sugar cereals and other things like that. Um, and I do think that it's going to take limits on advertising of hyperpalatable foods. Um, and then also just a societal understanding that uh, most people are dealing with a weight problem that's impacting their health. Most people are. That pushing food on people isn't helping them. Um, that when someone moves into the neighborhood, you should bring them flowers or a potted plant or you know, uh, a, a new set of measuring spoons or pot holders or something, you know, and not cookies, you know. Um, and, you know, we need to really change a lot of our cultural norms around what's helpful, what's kind, what's thoughtful, because most people are struggling with this issue now. Most people. Well, that is for sure. Susan, and you know, I, I as I wish we could solve all of this here and the three of us together, powerful woman, you know, it, 
it's going to take a while. And I guess all we can do is do our best one day at a time in this business. And yeah. for sure, I feel you're doing that. And uh, from my part, you know, I'm, I've been honored to, to have you here with us and uh, doing this for the Food Addiction Institute and have you join our forces there. And uh, which is, uh, is what we, we are doing is, is building bridges, ba building bridges between professionals, building bridge bridges uh, from, you know, people needing the help and professionals and, uh, and also for, uh, you know, for the governments and, and policy making and all of this. And, uh, and uh, so, so we, we can do a lot together on our own. I think, you know, we're pretty, we, we, we can't do as much. And uh, so thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here today and for all the wonderful work that you do, uh, Susan. Thank you, Esther. It's been such a pleasure. And I want to concur with Esther, everything that she said. And Susan, what a joy. I'm just nodding and nodding and <laughs> agreeing <laughs> all the way through. So celebrations and let us, um, whenever somebody has fallen off, at one time you were calling it resume. And I loved that term because we do, we start with new energy and enthusiasm to continue the pursuit of a better world for all of us with this issue so thank Absolutely. you thank you thank you cynthia so lovely thank to be with you both thanks so much likewise